you have your Bible this morning, turn with me to Luke chapter 1. We're going to read together beginning in verse 26 and reading down through verse 38. Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 26 and reading through verse 38. And if you are able and willing to stand, then would you please stand in honor of the public reading of God's word. Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 26, and this is what the word of the Lord says. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. May we pray together. Now our Father, as we journey back to Nazareth and linger for a moment in Mary's home, help us to see how you invaded her world, placed a calling on her life that was out of reach for Mary, but not out of reach for you. Show us, Father, her yielded obedience to your will and cause us, God, this Christmas to see that all you want from us is the same thing, yielded obedience. May we all leave this place today saying, Lord, the callings of God are too great for me, but they aren't too great for you. Let it be according to your will in my life. We pray it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. You may be seated. Throughout this season called Advent, our sermon series, our devotional guide will take us along this theme, Home for Christmas. Some of you remember that song that we sing sometimes at Christmas, I'll be home for Christmas, and that song comes down to the end and says, if what, only in my dreams. I'm here to tell you that the God of heaven and earth wants to come home to your home for Christmas. Not in your dreams, in the real world where you live, where your happenings go on, where you get into arguments and fusses and feuds, where you worry over how you're going to pay the bills, when you wonder how all the troubles are going to be worked out. Right in the tight space of your life, God wants to show up in your home. For Christmas. As we walk through his word this Advent season, we're going to see some of the characters of the Christmas story whose lives, whose homes were invaded by the incarnation of Jesus Christ. 
We start today with Mary's home. Next week, we're, we're going to go to the shepherd's home out in the fields, abiding, keeping watch over their flocks by night. We're going to travel to the temple and see a man named Simeon whose life was changed by the, by the incarnation of Jesus Christ. We're going to come down to Matthew's Gospel on the fourth Sunday of Advent and meet some magi who traveled a long way from home to teach us a lesson about worship. And then on the very last day of this month, we're going to turn to a passage that will stir our souls and maybe scare us just a bit as we think about that crying that went up from the mothers of Israel in Bethlehem and the surrounding region as they mourn the loss of their little boys. But the incarnate Christ was there too. And he changed their sorrow and gave it meaning. And all throughout this journey, as we consider the lives of those who were changed by Jesus, we're going to keep coming back to this statement that God wants to come home to your home for Christmas. Some of you already have him there. You're here because you love God and you have a relationship with him through his son Jesus. But some of you are here today and you've never let God come into your home. You don't have a relationship with him by faith in Jesus Christ. You've never turned away from your sin and turned toward Jesus in faith. And the prayer of my heart and I hope the prayers of God's people is that this Christmas you'd meet Jesus in a real and a personal way and call on him to be your own Savior and Lord. As we think about this story of Mary's home, I'm reminded of a scene from my childhood. I bet something like this took place in your home. Maybe you've been this child. Today's kids have it easy, do they not? They just, now, some people said that about me in 1995, and it was true then too, so let's get that out of the way. I had it easy, but they got it easier. It would have been grand, would it not? Y'all go with me on this. It would have been grand in those days when we were flipping through morning television looking for something to watch when all we had was Bob Parker and The Price is Right, right? It would have been better to have this thing called an iPhone and to have Netflix and, and Prime to stream, right? We could have called anything up at any time of the day and just had had our television viewing right there in our hand, okay? But we didn't live in that day, most of us. And so instead, what we had was a 32-inch was a console television that weighed about 600 pounds in the living room, took up half the living room. How in the world a TV screen could be that small but take up that much space? It's hard to believe, but it was there. And we had a remote that was like a brick. It weighed two pounds. And the buttons were that big. And you're pressing those buttons trying to call up something to watch. And in my day growing up, I, we watched a lot of Nick at Night. We watched all these reruns of things. And, and I loved, I loved, and I still love, I Love Lucy. It's one of my favorite shows. It's awesome, okay? If you don't like Lucy, we're going to have to work that out, okay? But I love Lucy, all right? And I can remember laying on my parents' 10-foot uh, Sears and Roebuck sofa. That thing was as long as the room. Laying on that sofa at night, TVs over there across the room. And I Love Lucy would come on at 7 o'clock. My bedtime was 8. My mama had things that she wanted us to do. And I would say, but just let me watch I Love Lucy. And Mama would go about and she'd be doing the things that Mamas do. She's doing the laundry. She's taking care of the kitchen, getting it all cleaned up. She's trying to make sure that our home is operating because that's what Mamas do. And I'm sitting there trying to get in as much I Love Lucy as possible. And I'm hoping, I'm hoping that she won't walk back in before this episode ends and the next one begins so that rather than her saying, okay, it's over, it's time for you to get up and do your chores, instead I can say, but I got to finish this one and then I'll get up have y'all played this game some of you played this game as children some of you have played this game as adults with your kids and some of you have played this game both ways 
you've got it all figured out. But at some point as the night wore on, there was always that moment, wasn't there? When it became abundantly clear who the authority in the home was. And it was not me. And at some point, I had only one choice to make. To yield, to accede to the authority. And to do what Mama said. Do you know that sometimes our relationship with the Holy God is like that? God is calling us to step out in faith. He's calling us to walk in obedience. He wants us to be found faithful at tasks and commands that he's put into our lives, not only for our own good, but for the good of others. And rather than swiftly getting up and rising to the occasion and obeying God's calling on our lives, instead, what we do is we play that game with our Heavenly Father. And we say, listen, I'm being entertained right now. I'm being entertained by, by the, my favorite activities. I'm being entertained by, by my favorite drug or alcoholic beverage. I'm being entertained uh, by this, this job that I have where I'm making a name for myself. I, I'm being entertained, God. And what I'd really rather is, is that you just let me go on being entertained a little longer before I surrender. And we're hoping that when God comes around again, we will be so involved in what we're being entertained by that we can start that argument up again and say, well, listen, I just need to finish this. And then I'll be glad to do what you want. But you see, dear friends, at some point, the God of heaven and earth makes it abundantly clear that he is the authority. That his will and way must be accomplished. And that the only path that leads to life and blessing and health and joy and peace is the path of yielded obedience. Mary found that out in her little home in Nazareth. Can you imagine what it must have been like? Here she has been betrothed to Joseph, a carpenter. And Joseph, probably a little older than her. Mary's probably not very old at all, 12, 13 years old, probably the custom of the day. A bridal price has been offered at some point in the past, and so this union has been sealed, and they are waiting for a ceremony to occur at some point in the future, after which they will begin to live together as husband and wife. But here an angel of the Lord is dispatched from the gates of glory and appears in her room in the middle of the night to make a statement to Mary. This angel shows up and says to Mary, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. And what does Luke tell us about Mary's response? Well, he says... She was greatly troubled. No joke. I'm minding my own business. I'm living my life. I'm tending to the affairs of, of just getting through an ordinary average day in Galilee. And an angel of the Lord shows up and says, The Lord is with you. You found favor. Greetings from God. Hey, man, this is terrifying. It's troubling. This isn't something that happens every day. It'll catch you by surprise. God caught Mary by surprise there in her home in Nazareth in order to change your life. One of the things that's interesting for us to think about is that as the evangelist Luke pins this gospel, he does so not as an eyewitness, but as a historian. He is the physician historian Luke. He's a doctor and he's an historian. He intends to write an orderly account for his patron, a high-ranking government official named Theophilus, who has heard about the life and times of Jesus of Nazareth and wants to know if the things he has heard are true. 
So sometime around the year 60 AD, Luke has departed from his companion, the Apostle Paul, and Luke has traveled probably back to Judea, and he's investigating, he's asking the hard questions, he's talking to people who were there, he's writing an orderly account. Luke doesn't present this as his thoughts or reflections. Luke doesn't offer these words as merely his remembrances. No, Luke has gone to the sources and offers this up as fact. So when we are let in to the mind of Mary, the mother of Jesus, understand this, brothers and sisters. This is not what Luke thought happened. This is what Mary herself says she felt. These are the things that Mary experienced that she has either told to her friends or maybe if she's still alive at the time of Luke's writing that she has told to Luke himself. So when it says that she was greatly troubled, she was greatly troubled. She's filled with turmoil. This is a hard thing to understand. What in the world an angel of the Lord dispatched from the gates of glory to bring me a message? What could it be? The angel responds in verse 30 and says to her what we often hear angels saying, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great. And will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. As we think about Mary's home being invaded that first Christmas. One of the things that we call to mind. Is that Mary's position in redemption's story is unique. There will never ever be another virgin girl from Galilee who is given an annunciation by an angel that she will have a child conceived by the Holy Spirit whose mission and life's work will be to save the world. It'll never happen again. Mary's place is unique in the story of redemption's history. And yet, even as we think about the fact that Mary's place in redemption story is unique, one of the things that we learn from Mary is that what God was doing in her, in calling her, in using her, in working through her, in doing the impossible in her life, He wants to do in you and me as well. Because you see, brothers and sisters, the calling that God made upon Mary's home that he would do the impossible in her life, that though she was not able to fulfill this calling on her own, God would fulfill it through her. He does the same to you and me. God calls to you. He wants to use you. He wants to make much of you in his story of redemption. And you sit there today and you say, listen, I I don't know much about Galilee, but I know a lot about St. Clair County, and it ain't exactly downtown New York City. It's not much on the world stage, I'm telling you, preacher. It's just a little out-of-the-way place. I'm here to tell you, friend, you might be from an out-of-the-way place. And you may think that your resources aren't vast. And you may not think that there's anything that you can give to God that He couldn't get from somebody else. But I'm here to tell you that the calling of God upon your life to follow Him in obedience will yield a unique blessing to redemption story that no one else can give. And what God is trying to do in you and me is what God was trying to do in Mary. To get us to see that his callings are not bound up in the strength of our faith, but in the sufficiency of his favor. Did you notice that? 
When God calls to Mary through this angel of the Lord and says this is what's going to happen, he does so first by reminding her that his favor rests upon her. The angel says to her first, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. The angel says, do not be afraid, Mary, verse 30, for you have found favor with God. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. When you and I think about the calling of God in Mary's life, one of the first things that we should take note of is that the fulfillment of this calling doesn't rest upon Mary's strong faith, but upon God's sufficient favor. Why can Mary walk in obedience? Why can Mary bring forth this child? Why can Mary endure all the hardships that are going to come her way as she receives ridicule and shame and reproach among the people in her community? It's because the favor of God rests upon her. My friend, sometimes in our work in God's world, we begin to think that it's all a matter of our wit or wisdom. That our fulfillment of God's plans and purposes is a matter of our faithfulness. That if we're going to do God's work, we've got to have all of the resources sewn up in advance. Some of you are like your pastor, just as pragmatic as can be. You want to know how it's going to happen 10 months before it happens. I'm just being honest with you. That's how I am. I'm as conservative as the day is long when it comes to our plans. I want to know that we've got it worked out. But you know what? That is not how God works. The callings of God do not come upon our lives in a way that are bound up in our strong faith, that are bound up in our vast resources, that are bound up in our abilities. If it's the calling of God upon our life, then we can just about take it to the bank that on our own, in our power, in our strength, with our ability, we will never be able to accomplish it. But the callings of God are not fulfilled because of our strong faith, but because of His sustaining favor. Mary is able to walk in obedience to God because His hand of grace rests upon her. What is God calling you to? For some of you who are here today, the first thing God's calling you to is to take the step of obedience in faith. You've heard the gospel over and over and over again. But you've never turned to Jesus in trust. You've never called upon the name of the Lord. You've never asked Him to save you from your sins. I was talking to a preacher friend of ours uh, on our vacation. We had a real short one, but anyways. Uh, On our vacation this week, we went and saw this pastor friend of ours and And I was telling him about one of the burdens of my heart, which is that in spite of the fact that we give this gospel appeal and that we try to make it abundantly clear what is the nature of the gospel, that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again in the place of sinners in order to save them from the effects of their sins, we do not seem to see a great deal of response. And I was telling this pastor friend of ours said, you know, that's a great burden to my life as a pastor. And he said, well, you know, one thing you've got to consider is you've probably got a lot of saved people in your congregation. Maybe you're not having a lot of people who are there who are unbelievers. And I said, yeah, but I know, I know we've got unbelievers in the room. And he said, maybe you need to explain what it is to repent. So I'm going to take the advice I was given for a minute. And I just want to make this abundantly clear. If you are sitting here today and you say, listen, I get what you're talking about. Jesus died, he was buried, he rose again, and he did that so that the penalty that I deserve, which is death, was placed on him and not on me. 
so that he takes away the curse of my sin so that I can have eternal life. If you are sitting here today and that makes perfect sense in your mind and you say, I, sign, seal, delivered, I agree with that, then the Bible says that the way you act upon that is to confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and to believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. So if you are here this morning and you've never called upon the name of the Lord, but you believe that he is your Savior, walk down this aisle at the end of this service and say to this congregation, I want Jesus as mine. Church, come on now. That ought to be the desperate cry of our hearts that when sinners come under conviction, they would call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. Some of us are here today and the calling of God upon our life is to walk in obedience and be saved. Some of us are here and the calling of God on our life is to go back home, to talk to our husband, to talk to our wife and say, listen, we haven't been found faithful in being a part of God's work. We're just kind of half-hearted in our devotion to the church. We're not... We're not really committed. Let's get committed. Let's make a decision as our family that we're going to make a priority of being about God's business. For some of you, the calling of God means reprioritizing your finances and deciding that whether you've ever done it before, you're going to be committed to kingdom giving. For some of you, the calling of God means going somewhere else. It means stepping out and going in service to God in a faraway place with a strange-sounding name, but because you desire that all people should know Jesus as their Savior and Lord. I don't know what the calling of God is upon your life, but I'm here to tell you there is a calling on every one of our lives, something that God wants us uniquely to do as a part of redemption story. And if you're here today saying, I don't have a strong enough faith to accomplish that understand my dear friend it doesn't rest upon the strength of your faith but upon the sufficiency of his favor when we think about the calling of God upon Mary's life and upon our own we first recognize that his calling does not rest on the strength of our faith but the sufficiency of his favor but number two when we reflect upon the calling of God on our lives, one of the things we have to recognize that Mary had to recognize is that the calling of God may be, in fact, probably will be beyond our reach, but it is never beyond the reach of God. Do you see Mary's response to the angel? She says in verse 34, How will this be since I'm a virgin? Now, I just got to tell you, Mary was a country girl, right? She, she's, from, she's from Galilee, from Nazareth, little town, small town girl. This is a small town girl response. I love it. I love it. It's just as plain and simple as it can be. Listen, I know how it works. Joseph and I have not consummated the marriage yet. We hadn't gotten that far. How in the world am I going to have a kid? Mary is pragmatic. She's practical. And in the practical nature of her question, she misses the opportunity for the miraculous. I wonder how often in my life, in your life, we've missed the opportunity for the miraculous. I wonder how many times we've looked at God, we've heard His calling, we've sensed the leading of His Spirit, we know, God, I, you want me to do this. And we say, listen, I don't see how that can work. I'm not going to go there. I don't see how that's going to play out. I don't want to take that step. I'm afraid of what the outcome might be because I can't control that situation. I'm just going to hang back where I know I'm comfortable and safe. God, this is your calling. I don't know how that can be. I'm just going to stay over here. Have you ever done that? Have you ever wanted to have it so figured out, to have it all put together, to know that you've got the resources, the ability, the strength, the grace, the faith, the finances, the power 
to affect what God is calling you to. And when you think you don't have it, you just say, you know what? It must not be the right time. I'm here to tell you one of the things that Mary had to learn, one of the things that you and I have to learn is that the callings of God are often beyond our reach. They are never beyond God's. Mary says, how can this be? I'm a virgin. We haven't consummated the marriage. We, there's no way there could be a kid. And the angel of the Lord responds to her, does he not? Verse 35 the angel answered her and said, The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. The angel of the Lord says, listen, let me give you a tangible, a tangible situation. Let me give you something practical you can sink your teeth in. Let me tell you a story so that you know whatever God wants to do, God can do in your life. Let me tell you about Elizabeth. You know Elizabeth, Mary. She's your cousin. She's your kin. We all got kin, right? We got mama and them. All right, let me tell you about some of the people you're related to. And the angel says, you know Elizabeth, she spent her whole life barren. She's old, she's advanced in years, Zechariah says. She has long borne the reproach of her people. So what does that mean? It means that she was shamed in a culture that's based on honor and shame and in a culture where to have children is to enjoy the favor of God and to not have children is to be cursed by God, Elizabeth bore the shame of barrenness her entire life. And year after year, she pleaded with God, her husband pleaded with God, calling upon God to bring them a child. And year after year, they watched all these other women around them get pregnant and have children, and they continued to bear the shame of barrenness. And the angel says to Mary, you know your cousin that's old and long past childbearing years who everybody says must be cursed of God. The Holy Spirit's doing a work in her life. She's going to have a child too. She's in her sixth month. Mary's going to go check that out in just a few days as we read in the story. Mary, you don't have to have it all figured out. You don't have to understand. It doesn't have to be within the realm of what you think is possible because though it may be beyond your reach, it is not beyond God's. One of my favorite preachers, probably one of yours, is the late, great Adrian Rogers. Adrian Rogers said one time that everything that is over my head is under Jesus' feet. My friend, that is of great comfort to me in these days in which we're walking. There is turmoil and trouble, cause for anxiety and worry all around us. And the callings of God upon our lives to walk in obedience in the face of such difficult days in which we live means that often the things that we've got to do for the Lord are beyond our reach. They seem impossible. But He's got it. It's not beyond His reach. It's not impossible with Him. Some of you are sitting here today and you've been on the fence for years. You know what God wants you to do. You know the step that you need to take. You know the next place of obedience that's needed in your life. But you've been holding back because you don't think there's any way that it can be accomplished. You know the conversation you need to have with that family member or that friend who's lost and in need of Jesus. You know that way that you need to, to begin serving God with the gifting of the Spirit that He's given to you. You know that God wants you to start a small group here in this church or that God wants you to begin uh, witnessing in your neighborhood. You know that God wants you to begin using your work as a way to bless the work of God in the world. Whatever it is, there's something that the Spirit of God has been gnawing on your heart at and for so long you've been holding back saying listen I don't know how it can happen I'm not sure that I can accomplish it I don't have the ability to affect that change God I'm just going to stand over here and God is calling to you like God called to Mary to say listen it might be impossible for you but I've got it 
So walk in faith. As we think about the callings of God, one of the things we've got to come to grips with is that it's, the callings of God are not fulfilled because of our strong faith, but because of His sufficient favor. As we think about the callings of God, one of the things we realize is that they may often be beyond our reach. They are never beyond His. And then as we look at verse 38, and we reflect upon the callings of God on our life, one of the things we must realize, brothers and sisters, is that the, is that the calling of God upon all of our lives deserves a response of yielded obedience. Look at how Mary responds to the angel of the Lord. She says, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. You know, there are a lot of times in my life when I've said, I'm your servant, but I'm going to do what I want. Do you understand that those two statements can't be simultaneously true? That you cannot say, I am the servant of the Lord, and then say, I'm going to do what I want? Do you understand there are a lot of people in God's church who claim a relationship with God by His Son, Jesus Christ, who have been living a life saying, I love God, I serve the Lord, but I'm doing what I want. That's all and well and good to a point. But there comes the moment when the line is drawn in the sand. And like that little kid stretched out on that Sears and Roebuck tel uh, sofa watching another episode of I Love Lucy, there comes a point when you realize who's in charge. And the only option is to yield and obey. I'm here to tell you God's drawing the line in the sand for you and for me today. I don't know what it is that His calling is drawing you to in your life. For some of you, it's that first step. It's to call on the name of the Lord and be saved. For some of you, it's, it's to take the second step, to walk up here and say, listen, I, I've never followed God in believer's baptism. I, I want to get that right. I want to demonstrate to the world that that my faith is in Jesus, that I've died with Him and raised with Him by faith. For some of you, it's to come and say, listen, I, I, we don't belong to any church. We, we need a home. We need a place where we're going to worship and commit, a place where we can serve and be served. You ought to come down this aisle today and say, listen, we, we want to know about joining friendship. We'll talk about it. For some of you, it, it's a calling to missions. For some of you, it's a calling to evangelism right next door. For some of you, it, it's, it's a calling just to reinvigorate your quiet time. You don't have one. It's time to get one. But you may sit here and say, well, listen, Pastor Mary's unique. Her story's one of a kind. She's the only one who ever is going to be the mother of the Messiah. You're right. But God wants to use you uniquely, too, in His kingdom's work. Because if you would yield in obedience to Him, my dear friend, there is something that God can and will do through you that He could do through nobody else and it will transform the kingdom of Christ in a way that only eternity will reveal. So I just want to know today, as God comes home to your home for Christmas, will He find someone who wants to go on in rebellion? Or will he hear that faithful response? I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be it to me according to your word. If your yielded obedience requires a public response today, we're going to sing in just a moment. And when we do, why don't you walk down this aisle and talk to me? If it requires a longer discussion, why don't you find me when we're leaving today and let's talk about what God is doing in your life. If it means that before you eat that fried chicken or that leftover turkey or ham, you sit down with your husband or wife or your son or daughter and say, listen, we haven't been living right, but we're about to start. Then you take that step today and yield to the calling of God 
in your life.